Okay, right. Um, so, welcome everybody. Uh, thank you for joining us. Um, as Peter just said, we're going to have a little chat with you about waders, um, so how to identify them, the habitats they like, and also how to do your own survey on your farm. Um, so we'll start, it'll be quite basic, um, so apologies for anyone who already knows all the breeding waders, uh, but we thought we'd keep it at a fairly basic level for those who didn't. Um, if you want anyone who knows a lot more, wants even more information afterwards, all the details will be at the end and feel free to get in touch with us. So the next slide please, Tina. So we're going to talk about how brilliant waders are, a bit about their ecology, uh, and then the status of waders in the UK, um, why you would want to survey them, and then how to survey them, and then wader identification, and a little bit about breeding wader habitat management, and then there's just a little bit about where you <coughs> can go for resources and support at the end. Um, as Peter said, generally, if you stick your questions in the chat, we'll get to them at the end. Um, but Tina will probably survey, uh, Paul, sorry, after the how to survey part, in case there's anything you need clarifying specifically on that that you uh, want to talk about immediately. Next one, please, Tina. So these are some waders um, that you won't see on your farms in Cumbria. Uh, there's 213 species of waders uh, worldwide. Uh, so I just thought I'd put are few waders that we get here in context for you come in all shapes and sizes they populate all different parts of the world uh, which are quite good fun some of them the next slide please so as i've said they come in all shapes and sizes lots of them and um, they're also global travelers so the ones i'm talking about we'll mostly be focusing on today don't travel very far, they're fairly local migrants, they'll move from the hills to the coasts and back again, maybe as far as France, somewhere like that, um, Ireland. Um, but some waders actually travel all around the world. This, this uh, bird here is the turnstone, uh, which anyone who visits the Northumberland or Cumbria coast in the winter time may be familiar with. Uh, they breed up in the high Arctic and there's a population that breed in the high Arctic the winter on our coastlines in northern England, places like that, and then there's another population that breeds over in the northern parts of Scandinavia and they will travel all the way down to West Africa. Uh, some other species are known to travel from places like Shetland all the way down to South America, that sort of thing. Uh, so they're, they're very uh, interesting species for that. And there's niches everywhere dependent on species and the time of the year. Um, they can occur in all those habitats on the list. I'm not going to read them out. You can all read, so I'm not going to read all the habitats out to you. Um, but yes, they, they, they can occur everywhere in the world. But obviously the ones we're focusing today on are mostly the ones that breed on your farms in the Forgotten Lands area uh, on farmland and moorland habitats. So next slide please, Dina. A bit about their ecology. So breeding waders are long-lived birds generally. They 15 to 20 years is quite normal uh, for the birds that like curlew and lapwing, things like that. The record for curly though is 31 years and oyster catcher have been known to breed up to about uh, live up to about 41 years old we know that from ringing records a bird that was caught down on the wash estuary a few years ago had been ringed 41 years earlier so they can live a very long time if the conditions are right they mostly nest on the ground all our ones here in the uk nest on the ground uh, but in other parts of the world there are a few species out there that nest in trees um they're Again, our ones are monogamous, but there are exceptions around the world. So birds like the ruff, uh, which sometimes winter on the coast here in the UK and breed in places like Scandinavia, so in Norway and Finland. And they have an elaborate lecking display, a bit like grouse do. And they're not, mon they're not monogamous, they, uh, they'll have many, many partners. Mostly shared parental responsibility. So you'll see both adults um, caring for both incubating the eggs and also caring for young and keeping an eye on them and the young generally are mobile as soon as they hatch uh, so nearly all our species uh, have what we call precocial young which means they're very well developed as soon as they leave the egg they can feed themselves they can run about for themselves and yes they're looked after a bit by their parents but they're pretty much fending for themselves from when they hatch to when they fledge and then they'll head off uh, for the winter time to where they migrate in groups usually and there are exceptions to that so snipe will stay in the nest a little while 
um, after hatching and oyster catchers, although they run around the field quite a lot straight after hatching, are fed by their parents for the first couple of weeks. On the next slide please, Gina. And breeding waders have three basic needs uh, <coughs> during the season. They need food for the themselves, the adults. Um, most waders have long bills and that's because they like to probe in the soil and especially adapted for that and a little different bill lengths depending on the species. Um, but they will also pick surface invertebrates as well. Uh, they also need food for the chicks and the chicks mostly feed on surface insects. So things like wet areas of your field that are full of midge larvae or areas with dung, farmyard manure, where there's a huge concentration of invertebrates are really important for, uh, for them in the springtime. And the third thing they need is nesting sites. So they, as I said before, ground, nesting on the ground um, in, and they're normally in very open areas. They don't like to be near trees, most of these birds. And uh, they like to have a good visibility all around them. So they'll quite often be on top of a hill somewhere or maybe a tussock, that sort of thing, to watch for ground predators or other threats. So ground nesting birds, obviously, so they're, they're quite vulnerable to lots of dangers, which I'll talk a little bit more about later. So also important are some of the habitat that they need. They're like, quite like damp soils, um, the vegetation has to be right, and the topography as well, that open aspect, like I mentioned before. But I'm going to talk about that a bit later on in the talk, so I won't dwell on that one now. Next slide, please, Tina. So what are these species that I um, keep alluding to? Uh, so the five main species I'm going to talk, we, we're going to talk about tonight are the ones on the left. So curlew, lapwing, oyster catcher, red shank and snipe. And those species breed all in the Forgotten Lands area. So you may have one more, all of those species on your farms. And the species on the right hand side, I'm not going to talk about tonight very much, but I just wanted to mention them. So golden plover and dunlin are very much moorland breeding species. On the blanket bog. A uh, common sandpiper you might see down on the rivers, so uh, some of the big, bigger rivers they breed on, they like nest nesting on shingle, that sort of habitat, fast flowing streams. And then woodcock, um, you probably know more from the winter time if you know them because we get a big influx from the continent and they'll be more hanging out in scrub and woodlands, um, but they do feed out in open pasture as well. Uh, and if, if any of you want further information on those particular species, again, let us know at the end of the talk and we can always provide that sort of thing. So the next slide please, Tina. So this is your first picture of all the five birds that we're going to go through the ID of in a bit. So hopefully most of those are familiar to you already. If they're not, then we're going to run through it in some detail, so they will be soon. And the next one, and these are the other four that we're not talking about tonight. Um, but as I mentioned, we'll, I can give you more information about that in the future, if you so wish. Um, next one, please. Um, the curlew are really important species. Um, the UK has about 25% of the global population. And we are the third most important country in the world for breeding curlew after Russia and Finland. But unfortunately, um, curlew have declined quite a lot. Uh, in recent years and they are now classified as near threatened on the IUCN red list. And if you see that graph on the bottom left there you'll notice that the graph goes down um, indicating uh, that over time the population is declining. And if I showed you graphs for the other breeding wader species that we're talking about tonight they'd look broadly similar although most of those species aren't classified as near threatened and they're not globally of global threatened. They are all a declining species. So anything we can do on our farms to encourage them and help them is all for the good, really. Next one, please, Dina. And as I just mentioned, curlews are in real trouble. So there's a real possibility that curlew become extinct soon. Um, Ireland have had a 96% decline since 1995, so that's not very long. Um, and then you can see the declines there for Wales, Scotland and England as well. So what do the future, does the future hold for curlews? And living and working where we do, um, we, it's easy to think curlews are everywhere in the, in the north of England, um, but we're really lucky um, and they're not. Yeah, they've really declined from a lot of places in southern England. So for instance, you know, Dartmoor, there's one pair left. Uh, I've just, and I've just mentioned Ireland, we've got 96% decline. 
Northern Ireland, I think there's a couple of hundred pairs left, so they're really in trouble. And there's nine species of curlew worth worldwide, and two of those are probably extinct. So the Eskimo curlew and Slenderbill curlew. Uh, Eskimo curlew, I think, was last seen in the 60s, and Slenderbill curlew in the mid 90s. So those two species are already extinct. So we really don't want to lose uh, one that is really important to the UK. And uh, so we determine that they don't suffer the same fate. So Tina will now give you a little run through her project. Um, hi everyone. So um, my job for the next four years is to deliver um, part of the Curlew Life project for the RSPB. Um, it's a four year conservation project and it's been funded through the EU Life programme, which is the EU's funding instrument for the environment and climate. Um, so we've probably just got in uh, right at the end of the opportunity for that. Um, but we've also received support from some of the statutory agencies and from um, the Heritage Lottery Fund as well. Um, so we've got five project areas across the four UK countries. And here in England, we just have one. And on this map, um, the project area is shown in in blue and purple. So the purple is uh, RSPB Geltsdale Reserve and the off-reserve part of the project area is this area shown in blue. Obviously we're neighbours to you in the Forgotten Lands area and part of the Curlew, uh, part of the project area is overlapped by the North Pennines AOMB and partly by the National Park. Um, so what are we going to be doing? Will it be essentially working with landowners, farmers and the local community and volunteers to deliver action to halt the decline of, decline of curlew um, and so to also better define the action needed to maintain population of curlew across the landscape and across um, the wider project area. Um, so these are the main actions that we um, we hope we could be able to take uh, as part of the project. So firstly, working with landowners, um, advising and in some cases funding actions to en enhance conditions for breeding curlew. Um, and Janet's going to talk about those actions later on. We're going to be undertaking monitoring and evaluation, not only of curlews, but other breeding raiders, but, and also habitat condition and predators. And um, we hope that this will, oh, both target future action, but also evaluate how the population responds to those measures. And we're going to do lots of community engagement uh, to increase the understanding of the plight of curlew in the UK, ways to help them um, locally, but also hopefully um, disseminating that message to visitors and digitally as well. So spreading that message more widely. Um, we'll be working with our colleagues at RSPB Geltsdale to demonstrate and share best practice. Um, and we're also going to hopefully encourage and enable government bodies to take large scale action um, for the long term for this species. And that includes, we hope, a production of a forest sensitivity map, because what we know, um, obviously, and, and, and in the Forgotten Lands area as well, is that, is that um, action to to mitigate for climate change. Um, there's, a, there's a huge um, pressure um, on, uh, on land for tree planting, especially in the north of England. So we're hoping to provide scientific and useful information so that, 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 that the right tree goes in the right place, essentially. I'm back to Janet. Okay, um, so this map shows what's known as the grassland assemblage, um, which are the birds curlew, lapwing, redshank, snipe and yellow wagtail. Basically the brighter the colour, the more important an area is for those birds. So you can see obviously North Pennines comes out bright red, as you would expect. But the, the Forgotten Lands area there I've circled in blue, and you can see quite a large amount of that is yellow or orange, so it has three or four of those species um, present and breeding. So really quite important area uh, for our breeding waders. Um, so obviously a lot of this area also isn't designated so in a way it's even more important that we uh, look after our breeding waders in the Forgotten Lands area because it's not designated as a national park or an AOMB um, which often makes life easier so there's more challenges to overcome when trying to protect birds and wildlife on your farms with, uh, when it comes to 
applying for schemes and such like. And so these issues also make collecting evidence by surveys even more important, which is why we're talking to you today about sort of surveys that you might do yourselves and then hopefully that learning will then get sent down to DEFRA as part of your ELM test um, to develop a sch the scheme in the future. So the next slide please Tina. And the reasons breeding waders are declining are really varied. Um, there's a list of some of them there. I'm going to talk a bit the farm, the ones that are more farm practices and habitat management and predators I'm going to talk about later in the talk. Um, but Tina's already alluded to trees and this seems like a good time to mention trees again. The breeding waders we're talking about this evening are birds of the open countryside, they don't like nesting near woodland, particularly dense forestry. Uh, so this is, you know, things like the forestry investment zone are potentially a big threat to breeding waders and I know you're, you've all got concerns about that as well. Um, so it has, yeah, potential to have a negative impact on breeding waders. So if tree planting isn't planned well and they're planted in the wrong places, it can be a big problem. Um, so obviously we would like to see more trees, but in the right place. Uh, there are, there's still plenty of places they can be planted, I'm sure, even in the Forgotten Lands landscape, there'll be places that are suitable for trees, as well as those that really aren't. And next one please, Tina. So why would you spend your valuable time surveying waders on your farm? So I've already mentioned some of the reasons why having good evidence is um, really helpful. Um, but here's some reasons as well for why it's really worth taking the time for you to walk around your farm and record breeding waders. And I uh, completely appreciate that whilst the idea of uh, carrying out your own breeding wader surveys may seem a little bit daunting, or you just feel it might be taking valuable time out of your busy farming day when you've got precious little of that already. Um, but from uh, work that's happened in places like Wensleydale, where there's a results-based payment scheme pilot, they've done quite a lot of uh, talking to the farmers about how they find doing their own surveys. And they've found that um, most of the farmers really enjoy it. They better understand how their farm relates to the birds, appreciate where their management is working well or where it could be improved. Uh, and one farmer commented that his annual morning walk is now one of his favourite days of the year uh, as it was a chance to step back from the daily routine on the farm and really rewarding to see all his efforts uh, coming into fruition and helping both wildlife and his farm business. So Tina's just going to run through a really simple methodology that we've devised for you guys. Cool. So um, our task was to come up with a survey method that would provide useful information and support you in the ways that Janet's described, but that you could do fairly easily and quickly, and maybe even combine it with other tasks that you might have to do, such as soil sampling, something like that. So this is a one visit survey undertaken at any point during May, and this corresponds with a peak of breeding activity. Um, and the key thing is that it's consistent or repeatable and comparable both across time. So if you repeat it in future years, but also comparable with neighboring farms, if, if more than one of you undertake this monitoring method. Um, and, and it is a one visit method, but in all the respects follows fairly standard methods that we are using to survey breeding raiders in Northern England which are generally two or three visits. Um, and so it'll also be comparable across a wider landscape. So what, how, what to do and how to do it. So where to survey. Um, we recommend that um, you look at your farm map and um, devise a survey area or survey areas of about 60 hectares, um, which we think is about the largest size that, that one person should attempt to do it in the morning. It'll take, it depends on the, the complexity of, of the field layout, but it will take any time from a couple of hours to four hours maximum. And the idea is, is that you walk to within a hundred meters of every point in that survey area. Um, and this means that you're, taking a consistent approach across all of the land on your farm, no matter what the size of field. So in large fields like this one here, you might take a zigzag or a meandering line, but then in smaller fields, you can just simply walk straight across them. And in some cases, not even have to enter them because you're already close enough. <clears throat> and so what you would do, you would plan your route around that survey area, thinking about styles and gates and things like that, so that you can take sort of the easiest route around that as possible. 
And so whilst you're walking around, um, we recommend as a bare minimum that you serve, that you note these things. So date, um, start and end times, what the weather's like, um, crucially the location and number of all the target species, um, trying not to count the same birds twice, um, and also noting any um, chicks or young that you might see. Um, and then also some habitat information, which is really important. Um, things like field wetness, sward height and rush cover, rush cover. And we've devised quite simple ways of being able to note those quickly without spending too much time. Um, but you might also want to note things like movement and behavior. Um, and again, there's a, there's a simple or fairly simple, once you know how to do it, um, way of, of writing that information down quickly on your map. And this helps with a number of things. It helps you to interpret that information, what stage of breeding the birds might be in or sign, um, things like that. Um, we also recommend to note the presence or signs of any predators, in particular fox or carrion crow. And if you'd like a bird species list for your farm, you might want to also note any birds, other birds that you see or hear during your visit or anything else you think might be interesting. Um, and also useful to note um, with that information is broad land use type and sort of the, the type and, and, and uh, breed of stock that you have in each field. And what you would get from all of that is a snapshot, just a snapshot in time as a number and distribution of wages on, on the farm, but it'll tell you how they're using the land at that point in time, which fields may be more important, um, whether the, the birds are breeding or not, and coupled with habitat and environment, environmental information, and if repeated over time, could possibly show changes in how the birds are moving around and using the land and responding to factors such as changing weather and, and habitat change and predator presence. So at that point, does anyone have any questions uh, about that? We can provide, um, so I've written a survey methodology with resources alongside that as well. So if anybody's interested in understanding more, um, I can we can certainly help with that. Okay. Mm. Just in terms of the methodology, sorry, it's Veronica yep. here. Hi. Um, can we um, get circulate some of the slides afterwards because um, that's quite specific that methodology in terms of sort of how to walk around the farm and what to record. And we can we can sort of you know maybe put that into a template that might help some of the farmers. Yes, sure. So so I say we've written the methodology. This is just a snapshot of it, really. And if anyone was interested, we can certainly provide more information about how to go about it in resources, forms to fill in that help you know sort of how to how to note things on the map quickly so it doesn't take loads of time, things like that. So yes, absolutely. Okay, I'll, I'll carry on. Um, <clears throat> um, so just a general bit about identifying waders and what you would look out for, the, the general impression that you get and things that you might note that help you identify any bird really. Um, and for anyone who's not confident in identifying birds, getting started might seem a bit tricky, but if you persist, you can soon get your eye or your ear in. Um, if, if you practice. Um, but this is a summary, a, a summary of key factors that might help you identify what bird that you've seen. Um, and we've put together a series of slides with useful pointers and comparisons, which goes through this list in much greater detail, which we'll share with you afterwards. Um, and you can go through that at, at your leisure. Um, but putting all of those factors together, um, helps you come up with your identification. So I'm just going to run through the sort of key identifying factors for the birds that we're talking about this evening. So the curlew is our largest breeding wader, characterized by um, that long downward curving bill. Um, 
which is longer in the female than the male, although it's often difficult to tell the sex of curlew unless you see them close together. Um, they're quite camouflaged in colouring, um, so you might not see them in tall vege vegetation. Um, they have a very distinctive call, which I'm sure we all know and love, um, but their calls can be quite varied according to whether they're displaying or they're alarmed, and they have a distinctive alarm call, which can be used to, to determine whether or not they have any chicks. Um, so that's quite useful when you're monitoring for breeding waders because it helps you understand whether or not they have, still have chicks with them. Um, in flight, they're quite often to identify um, because their bill is quite visible, but they also have that distinctive uh, wedge of white feathers uh, above the tail. So lapwings are smaller than curlews, have lovely coloration, but often show quite black and white from a distance and in flight. The male, they both, the male and the female have this wispy crest, but it's often lo longer in the male. Um, the colouring of a male is a bit cleaner, uh, a bit more distinctive than the female and they have a bit more black around the chest area. Um, again, that distinctive call and, and they'll often flock together and have, I don't know how better to describe it as quite a flappy flight, but what's um, quite often useful in lapwing is to note sort of that rounded shape to the wing when they're flying. Um, red shank, I'm assuming are so-called because of their red orange legs, which are quite distinctive. Um, and they have that same colouring at the base of their beak as well. Um, they're otherwise fairly undistinguishing colour-wise, but in flight, um, that very distinctive white uh, V-shape um, is quite a good identifying uh, feature. And also these trailing uh, red legs as well. So snipe, much smaller, quite stocky, like to hide. Um, that long but straight bill this time is quite distinctive. Um, they, they're very secretive and shy and you often won't see them. You'll more hear them than see them. Um, you have to get quite close to a snipe to flush it from where they are in the undergrowth. But when they do flush, um, they'll fly away in a zigzag flight, which is um, a, a predator evader sort of tactic. Um, but their call is very distinctive, so they'll often they'll make two sounds um, when they're displaying or, or in breeding mode. One is to chip, which is a kind of a vocalization, um, which they generally do when they're hidden from sight. And the other is to drum, which is something that they do with their tail feathers, which you can see here. It's kind of a winnowing sound, and they'll do that when they're displaying above their territory. And then finally, the oyster catch is fairly unmistakable. It's a kind of an in-your-face kind of bird, black and white, huge, sort of ready orange beak, really, really noisy, hard to miss, really. Um, very, um, very distinctive bird. Um, and they, they, they show very clearly that uh, black and white colouring when they're flying. And I'm just going to run through a little bit about habitat. So where you see a bird can often determine, uh, help you determine what, what species of bird it is. Um, and this suite of waders have broadly speaking, as Janet's mentioned, uh, habitat requirements, but there are some differences. So curlew prefer taller, tusky vegetation for concealment, um, but also shorter, damp and insect rich areas to feed in. Um, they will breed in a variety of habitats, including heather moorland and damp pasture. They have large territories um, and studies have shown that curlew might fly fairly considerable distances from their nest sites. So they might feed, breed up in the moorland, but then fly down to lower the more improved um, pastures, lower down to feed in. Um, which means that if we're going to undertake any habitat management for curly, the, the, the need to do that on a fairly large scale across the landscape, if we're going to make any difference to curly. Um, 
In contrast to curlew lapwing habitat, they like a shorter sward, much shorter, far less uh, vegetation coverage. They do like a few tussocks here and there to hide behind. They'll use things like um, dung, patch, dung patches or, or areas of bare ground to conceal themselves or their chicks against. Um, and actually, um, in some areas, um, arable areas particularly, they will be attracted to patches of bare ground. Um, and, and, and some farmers might deliberately leave bare patches for lapwing um, if they're able to do that. Snipe, in contrast, because they like to hide, they like that tall vegetation for concealing themselves in, but they also like bits of shorter vegetation to feed in, but they move much shorter distances. So having that mosaic of habitat in a fairly small area is quite important for snipe. Um, red shank like it wet. Um, they will be attracted to areas that have um, standing water pools, wet ditches, scrapes, things like that. Um, so you'll often see red shank near to those sorts of areas. And finally, oyster catchers. Who knows why an oyster catcher will choose to nest where it does sometimes, but traditionally they do like shingle. So you might see them nesting um, on, on riverbeds and things like that, um, which they can be at danger of being washed out um, at times, um, I worked with a farmer in the Allen Valleys who had um, oyster catchers on the river that ran through her land and she had mown out the middle of some of the rush pastures and put some shingle in there to attract them away from the river because it was quite flashy. Um, but they'll breed in all sorts of unusual places. So that picture is showing them on top of a fence post, but uh, traffic islands. Uh, things like that, they get themselves into all heaps of trouble sometimes where they nest, but yeah, they're a bit more generalist in their requirements, I think. So that's me, back to Janet. Thank you, Tiva. Uh, so just a little chat to you, with you about grazing management and other habitat management, um, sort of things you can do on your farms for breeding waders. The so breeding waders are particularly attracted to soil conditions that are created by cattle or mixed stocking because they create that bumpy sort of texture with a mix of longer and shorter vegetation rather than just solely grazing with sheep where you do end up with a very uniform sword quite often uh, which also which makes nests less camouflaged um, so if having across your farm a variety of sword heights uh, caters for all the species really as Tina's just outlined for you um, when birds are sitting on eggs, it helps to have low stocking rates if you can in a field um, or, or even remove stock completely um, it's just to reduce the risk of nests being trampled. Um, so particularly if you've got um, some very lively young cows that have been indoors all winter, I wouldn't recommend necessarily releasing those straight onto a field where you know you've got a lot of breeding waders because um, you may have a bit of a problem with some nests getting trampled if you do. But Grazing animals are really important though, because the dung produced by them um, creates really good camouflage for nests and chicks as well, and increased invertebrate food for adults and chicks too. Um, I do quite a bit of bird ringing where you put rings on their legs to monitor them, uh, and doing lapwings is really difficult because they lie down, lapwing chicks just look like a bit of sheep poo. Um, they're really, you, know, even, you have to get someone to walk you in to where, it, where, where, you, where you saw it lie down because they're very difficult to see. But also spreading like applications of farmyard manure, um, ideally in sort of February time before the breeding season, if you can get on then, um, can also be very beneficial for camouflage and also for the amount of vertebrate food that it uh, produces as well. So next slide please, Tina. It wouldn't be a talk from me uh, unless I mentioned rush, because <laughs> uh, it's a bit of a pet subject of me, but rushes and breeding waders. So rush is a really important element of breeding wader habitat, um, but given the right conditions, as I'm sure you're all aware, uh, soft rush can quickly dominate grassland and make it not very good for farming, but also not very good for the wading birds. Um, so soft rush is an incredible plant. Each one of those little seed heads you see at the top of a soft rush um, has got about 8,000 seeds in it. And they can lie dormant in the soil for 20, 30, 40, whatever years. Uh, and when the ground conditions are right, they'll just pop up. 
uh, all over the place. The ongoing management may be required on some of your fields um, to stop them becoming dominated by Russia. Ideally, if you can just maintain a reasonable amount of rush, sort of 15, 20 percent by topping and grazing, then brilliant. Um, but if you end up with a field where it's got a bit out of control, like that middle photo there, then it's a big and sometimes a bit more expensive job to restore that land uh, once it comes infested. So next slide, please. This is. So this is an example of a field which is in the North Pennines in Baldersdale to be precise uh, and the top left uh, is how I first saw it when the farmer showed it to me and that is 100% soft rush it was the height of my hip I'm five foot seven and it came up to my hips um, yeah sheep couldn't get through it birds no chance of getting through it and it's a 20 hectare field with basically that so it was no good for the farm anymore it was no good for waders anymore uh, and we had a little bit of grant money at the time through uh, a legacy that had been left to um, in the local area. And uh, so we managed to use a little bit of that money to help try and restore this field by weed wiping with uh, Roundup. The top right photo just shows what the right hand plant on that photo was covered by the weed wiper and the left hand one is that's the line we used for the first. So we cut the field into three being a 20 hectare field. So we did a third each year. Um, so six months later, we had something in the first half of the third of the field, sorry, um, the left bottom left picture is what we ended up with. So you can see the rush there is all pretty much a bit more dead. It's shorter. There's grass in between the uh, rushes even. Um, and then 18 months later is the bottom right photo. So the left hand side of that photo is what the one at the bottom left looked like after the farmer had then gone in the following autumn and topped that. And then it had a following winter, you know, some more grazing. So you can see there's a few rushes popping up there, but there's also a lot of grass as well. And it's a lot, a lot better balance there. And then the right hand side of that photo, that's where we'd done the weed wiping of the next third of the following year. And the, um, we, we surveyed in that, those fields um, and the wader population has increased significantly. And the farmer's got a lot more grazing as well. So everyone's a winner, really. The next slide, please, Tina. Another thing you can do, which is really easy and really beneficial for wading birds is create scrapes. So scrapes are small, shallow pools of water. They raise the water table in a really localized way, impacting just a very small area of the field. And they're designed to dry out later in the summer as well, um, and then fill up in the winter time, uh, in time for the breeding waders coming back. And these features are, Red shanks in particular like these because they like open water. But generally, these features um, increase the amount of invertebrate biomass around. So midge larvae and things that things that breed in, in stagnant water are really condensed into these pools. So it makes it really easy for uh, wading bird chicks and adults to feed in those. The muddy edges, the adult birds can probe in the soil for earthworms, that sort of thing. And if every farm created a very a small number of scrapes, it would really help fledging success. Because um, adult birds don't have to walk their chicks very far from where they're nesting, then there's a lot less chance of them getting uh, eaten by a predator or coming into other sort of trouble, crossing roads and number of lapwing chicks you see at the side of the road sometimes. Uh, it's a bit frightening. Scrapes uh, shouldn't be fenced off from stock. It's uh, quite important that those edges stay muddy uh, and that they uh, pro to probe in the ground. And the hoof pinch and the cattle actually create even more microclimates with little pools of water in and more midge larvae and that sort of thing. So next slide, please. There's also some farm practices that you want, you want to try and avoid during the breeding season because um, they can be very damaging if carried out when there's eggs or nests. So things like harrowing and rolling, um, if done at the wrong time, can cause a lot of damage. Um, with your silage meadows, um, if you know you've got curlews breeding in those, then you really want to leave it, if you can, six weeks between um, seeing the curlews and then cutting your grass because it takes that for, it takes about a month for the eggs to hatch and then a couple of weeks for the curlews to be large enough to be able to run and escape any machinery. Uh, and another thing you can do if you think you've got curlews in a field but you need to cut your silage because it's, the, it's time, is um, if you mow from the middle of your field towards the edge then any curly chicks can run towards the edge and hide in the walls or go into the next field or whatever. So you've got more chance of um, them getting away from the machinery. 
And then the bottom right hand photo there is a field in down in the forest of Boland actually in Lancashire. But that field had always been really good for wading birds and it had been funded through about 10 years of stewardship schemes. And then the land was sold and the new owner, first thing he did was shove loads of drains in it uh, and dry it out and therefore it was no good for waders anymore. Uh, so having, if, if you've got damp habitats that you know waders like, I know it's nice to have nice dry fields, but really the waders do like them wet if you can put up with it. The next slide, please. Into the end now. Um, thought I'd better mention predators and predation. Um, so good habitat management is the main thing we need to focus on uh, for the excess of upland waders species. But there is some evidence, uh, as I'm sure you're all aware, uh, the generalist project predators such as foxes and crows can have a adverse impact on wader populations, particularly for egg and chick survival. So legal predator control is an option um, and may be necessary and worth thinking about if, if, you, uh, if you believe it to be a problem on your farm. And you can either do that via long non-lethal methods such as scaring, you know, even um, anti-predator fencing can be used, or lethal legal techniques such as larson traps and shooting and that sort of thing. But not all predation is caused by foxes and crows. So there's a wide variety of uh, wildlife and species that can um, cause problems for them. Being ground nesting birds, they're vulnerable to all sorts of things from hedgehogs to this, that and the other. But even birds like pheasant and uh, even sheep will have a munch on an egg if it finds one. Uh, this, the, that photo on the bottom left there was uh, a nest camera from a project at RSPB Geltsdale Reserve. They had nest cameras on a few nests uh, and they found that a particular sheep developed a taste and he came, came back for every egg in that nest. You know, once it had found it, it wandered off and it came back three or four times and they're pretty sure it was the same sheep doing it. And they developed a taste. Um, next one, please, Tina. Just finally, um, after all that about waders, I didn't want to let the talk finish without mentioning black grouse um, because black grouse uh, are a really important species as well. And there's really good potential that in the forgotten lands area, you can do lots of stuff for them. Um, so lex accounted on for black grouse. They're a lecking species, so we count them by the males um, when they're displaying in the springtime. And every six years, there's a survey carried out. And as you can see from the ones that are circled in green there, in North Northumberland, so places like the Cheviot and Otterburn, there's been a massive decline in uh, black grouse. Uh, so yeah, 97% decline. There's hardly, you know, the almost none left there now. But in the North Pennines, we're seeing a huge increase um, in, over that time. So they've increased by about 90%. Uh, so because of that, next slide, please, Tina. We're really interested in that area with the blue circle around it. So south of that blue circle is the North Pennines and the Dales, and to the north and the west is like, uh, obviously Dumfries and Galloway and southern Scotland. And the bit in the middle, as I'm sure you can see, is the Forgotten Lands area and the Hadrian's Wall corridor. Uh, so this area has real potential if we can uh, get some habitat management in there for black grouse to create stepping stones to join up those populations and hopefully repopulate in the end uh, further north into Northumberland as well. Because um, the, the birds that are breeding really well in the North Pennines need an outlet somewhere at the minute. The, there's only so far long they can go breeding in an area before they need to expand out. Um, and small numbers are now being seen in, you know, get a few reports every year of birds along Hadrian's Wall Corridor uh, and even in the Forgotten Lands area. So if you see or hear any black grouse, we're really keen to hear about it because <laughs> because uh, we're yeah really interested in in that. Um, final slide, please, Tina. So here's some of the things we can offer to you after this talk. So we can, uh, as Veronica requested, we can provide a copy of this presentation with all the notes that go with it. Um, we have the methodology that Tina has written, uh, which we're and all the bits and bobs that go with that to help you do some recording if that's what you would so wish to do on your farm. Um, we've written a wader ID tips document that we wrote for volunteers a few years ago, but happy to circulate that. And equally, we've got some MP3s uh, of wader calls, all the different uh, calls that Tina mentioned, alarm calls and 
display calls, this, that, and the other, which we can circulate. I used to put them on CDs for people, but these modern laptops don't have CD players anymore. So I can just send digital files with faith. And then we can also circulate some useful websites, apps, books, that sort of thing that um, you may find interested if you want to get into this a bit more. And if anyone out there is really, really keen and wants to do a full three visit way to survey or a full bird survey of your farm, again, just get in touch and we can point you in the direction of doing things like that as well. There's mine and Tina's contact details, and I'm sure Peter can pass them on to everybody as well. And that's all from us. So any questions? Thanks for listening. Thank you very much, uh, <clears throat> Tina and um, Janet. That was you no, know, that was really interesting. I got a lot from that. Um, yeah, I mean, if anybody's got any questions, just um, um, please fire away. But there's interesting statistics you said about the curlew, about just how important the UK is, and just quite staggering the decline. There's been um, just, well, in Ireland, for example, about losing about 95% in um, little more than 20 years. And just, just while worldwide and some species even, even extinct. Yeah, it's pretty terrifying stuff, isn't it? I mean, yeah, we kind of take them for granted a bit up here. Uh, don't we? Because we see them all the time. Yeah, so yeah. it's just good to put that in context for you because uh, you know, um, some people do say to me, well, why are you worried about curly fall? We see them all the time. Um, but it's not the case everywhere. It's like, you know, one pair left on Dartmoor. Um, yeah. 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 Uh, so, yeah really probably, um, probably due to the uh, extra badges down there, possibly. Uh, could be a factor. But I think it's more habitat related. I think the habitat's become so fragmented down there. Because uh, didn't the RSPB fence off somewhere so that the badgers and foxes couldn't get in and then there was like massive numbers? I can't remember where that was. I've read it somewhere. Uh, possibly. I don't know where that would be. I don't think it was on Dartmoor though. Oh but, no, not that far. No, no. like somewhere. But yeah, anti-predator fencing does work with uh, quite a few of our reserves. We've put anti-predator fencing up and it really does make a difference for ground predators. Um, yeah, definitely. But it, it, it's, um, it's a very expensive thing to do and it's difficult to do it across the scale large enough to make a real difference um, across the, yeah. sort of the landscape scale thing, stuff that we think we need to do to bring back curly populations. And the reason we focused on the area that we have for this project is because there are still a decent curly population there so we can work with that population uh, and hopefully show how they can be um, maintained and made stable. And so that we can influence, hopefully, habitat management and, and, and other measures across a wider area. Yeah, I bet, the, I bet it actually, if you could do it, I bet there's a huge link as to the number of badgers and the number of curlews. Possible. I don't know of any research that's been done on it. Um, I can... I think I think I have read about the research. Um, the research in, the, in England is a forty, or the UK is a forty-eight percent decline in curlew, but there is also a forty-eight percent increase in carrying crow numbers, and and those, <laughs> I don't know. I don't think it's just a coincidence that those two species are going in the opposite direction, and uh, and certainly looking back over the last. 15 to 20 years of research on um, weighted birds in general, uh, looking across Europe, um, the carrion crow had had much bigger impact as a species than, than badgers had. Um, yeah, if, so, if it sorry. was simply badger culling, for example, the southwest have eradicated huge numbers of badgers, but they haven't got much in the way of curly. So I, I don't know, that's perhaps, that's putting too much of a a link that may not be there. So wading birds and curlews are, are very vulnerable to a lot of predators but research has shown that the main predators of curlews and other wading birds are foxes and crows. What? So they're the species that we'd focus on mostly. Yeah so yeah other species haven't been shown to have an impact on the population yet from the I know of anyway but uh, yeah. No certainly on here we've got um, where, where we have badgers the curlews start nesting and then miraculously never produce any young. Where the badgers, where when you, if ever you're out at night and you, it's the only place that we see badgers, 
And it's the yeah. only place that we don't have curly rear young. So that's my bit of research. <laughs> Uh, it's always useful having research that you've seen it yourself, isn't it? Yeah. Mm. It's interesting to see what you say about the the black game. Uh, Bewcastle, the Bewcastle Fells was one of the the largest areas just after the war. I was talking to a couple of gentlemen who shot up here just as the forestry was being planted, and there was nothing to sh shooting uh, eighty to a hundred on a walk up day of black game in the Bewcastle Fells, round by the the picnic area and up there. Uh, right up towards the Northumberland uh, border. And that all disappeared about um, five or six years after the, the big block went in and planted. They, they took the leks out. Those were the first places that were planted. So, you know, to say the, the black game, uh, that area has been lost and lost forever under Sitka Spruce. You know, none of that was taken into consideration when the planting went in. But probably now it wouldn't be planted, knowing that it had such a huge population of black game on there. No, probably not these days. That's really interesting. Thank you. What's what is your take on that local um, disappearance of grouse in northern Pen uh, in North Northumberland and in not in the Pennines? Is that because the the Pennines are keepered fells and the and the North Northumberland is not, or, or is it the forestry thing? I mean, you guys must have thought about it. And... Well, keeper, uh, yeah. The whole of Bewcastle is hardly an area that's keepered, and and the numbers on the, I know the uh, the RSBB Gelstall uh, town. I was I was on there twenty years ago lambing sheep, and when as soon as that keepering stopped, the waders disappeared overnight, and it's only because it's as keepered as hard as what the grouse moors are selectively for foxes and for corvids, that the numbers are starting to return onto the, onto the reserve or they would have disappeared. And the problem is out here, there is no shooting estates out here, so it isn't keepered. And more and more of Northumberland is reverting back to wildness and trees, and there's less and less shooting, so there's less and less keepers. The keeper, you know, vilified as they have been with the RSPB, is the, the wader's best friend, because unless foxes and Covid's are controlled, the waders have absolutely no chance of surviving. I know just on my farm, the last three years will have averaged at least 80 crows a year being taken off here, and it's had a huge effect. The first year we did it, we took 140 crows off this farm. Every third tree had, 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 had crows in it. There was absolutely no chance of eggs making the way to chicks to being fledged. And, and the numbers were just disappearing overnight, and now they're starting to make a to bounce back. You can't have so many things against them because, you know, you go on about um, predation, but you don't take into fact that a wet few days amongst some of these things and, and torrential rain, and it knocks everything back. But if you've got that, that's going to come along every second or third year, along with that, the crows and the foxes, they've got absolutely no chance, and that's why numbers have dropped. You know, when you go back 50, 60 years ago, most of the upland areas within Cumbria and Northumberland, Pennines and all that was all keepered. And now there's very little of it keepered. The Forestry Commission came into this area and they had ranges and, and, and everything was controlled. Deer numbers were controlled. And now all the, the rangers do is uh, more of a security guard type thing. There's no crow, crow control or anything. And the problem with the Sitka spruce plantations is it, they're being put in little dots here and there because nobody wants to, to, to go against them. But all that creates is nesting spots for the crows. So the last little areas you've got left, they get surrounded by a few Sitka spruces and three fields away, there's, there's 10 or a dozen crows nesting in the thing and they'll just wipe out every little last bit of it. That's my own thought. I agree with you, Colin. I don't. <laughs> <laughs> But just for the record, you look like you need a bra from that angle. <laughs> <laughs> That's sexual harassment. <laughs> I wasn't saying I wanted to touch you. Uh, any more questions? Have you got another question, Charles? Yeah. You're on mute, Charles. <laughs> If, if the RSPB had analysed the, the rise in populations in 
you know, two adjoining areas. I mean, it, something's pretty, you guys must have looked into it. What, what is your take on the situation? Never mind. The black grouse. So black yeah, grouse, you mean? How it, how it was shot up in one area and, and bottomed in another one. Yeah, well, um, so it's GWCT that do the most of the black grouse research, but um, I think the North Northumberland um, population, the theory behind that, the crashes, is partly predation, but there, yeah, some of that is, there are still, is still some grouse moors up there and some keepering in the areas that were good for black grouse uh, around the bottom end of the Cheviot and places like that. So I think the, um, the main decline has been on the Otterburn training area, so the MOD land. Uh, so the theory is that it's um, to do with the habitat management on there uh, and the disturbance on there and all the MOD stuff that goes as, as they, MODs they, increased massively over recent years that that's had an impact. Okay, so you, you could you could link the decline in population with increased activity on the Otterburn ranges. That's what I've been told. <laughs> I, yeah, I haven't yeah, looked at the research myself, but that's what um, that's what Northumberland National Park. Uh, told me was the what had happened um so i've got no reason to but then in yeah north pennines yeah there's no doubting it predator control really does help the black grouse in the north pennines just as it, like it does the breeding waders um you can't deny it <laughs> uh, so yeah the, so the populations are doing really well and yeah we get bad years in the north pennines as well as good years you know with the weather so particularly if you get a bad winter you quite often find the following year after the bad winter is a bad year for black grouse, um, but they seem to bounce back. So you do get a peak and trough uh, thing going on, um, but they do bounce back. Um, one of the other threats with black grouse it, um, that happens in some areas, again, we're not seeing it so much in, in our area, is um, disease caused by, you know, from pheasant and partridge releases. So the vector, you know, vector populations, things going backwards and forwards, but uh, we're not seeing much of that happen, but it's, it's a potential threat, let's say. I've actually um, shot on the Otterburn range and I've been invited onto days on there and the, the fox control and um, the management has stopped completely with security problems. You know, there were terrorist threats and all the rest of it. They don't want people going around and actually controlling foxes anymore on there because of the security risk. So it has just been left wild. And I think the pheasant shoots and everything have all packed in because they couldn't rear pheasants on there because of the the fox population so if the pheasants aren't going to survive in a keeping environment the everything else has got no chance really outside that but i think that'll be something to do with it the predation yeah. and, and, and all the all the problems they've got with security on a on a site like that they just can't have people going around lamping and, and shooting things no you're probably right <laughs> just wanted to ask about um habitat and um, different different waders liking different types of habitat. I mean, I'm, I don't farm in the Forgotten Lands, but we do have a field um, that used to be very intensively grazed by horses and was very um, open, and it tended to have lapwings and oyster catches in. And now the, it, it's very um, undergrazed and it's got lots of curlews in, uh, but not lapwings and oyster catches. So it's almost like um, it's favoured one um, bird over another. Have you got any thoughts about sort of the priority species for the forgotten land? Is it curlews? Because um, it, it might require different um, habitat types. So, you know, a more open, maybe heavy, heavier grazed landscape might favour lapwings, but not curlews and vice versa. Yeah, I think there's, um, it's obviously a very large area, the forgotten lands area, so there's room for both, I mean, that yeah, yeah, curlews. You're absolutely right. Do like that sort of rougher ground, and they prefer a bit higher up the hill as well. Quite often, you quite often see them on more the more sort of allotmenty ground and towards the moorland uh, and that sort of thing, and more unimproved pastures. Uh, and then your more improved fields, where you're you know, even where you're lambing or you've got horses, that sort of thing, uh, which are really short grazed. Over, you know, or you've been you've grazed over the winter and then taken the stock off, so it's really short. Then that's where your lapwing is going to become attracted to. Uh, they do say that if you aim to please red shank, I don't know what the red shank status is like in the Forgotten Lands area, but they do say habitat wise, if you aim for what red shanks would like, then you're probably over the course creating a habitat that both curlews, lapwings and snipe would like as well, because a red shank kind of like in between all the others, they like some long areas and short areas, they like it wet with some open water, uh, so it really caters for all of them.
mean, that's quite an interesting fact. So it'd be quite useful for a lot for allotment, a large extent, um, with a large area where you could have where it's big enough to where you could focus on all of those um, um, using the red chunk as a base, and hopefully it'll uh, attract all the others as well. I think I've, I've just got a couple of questions, if that's okay. Um, one is um, uh, just finishing off this discussion about um, predators and the discussing of um, areas that are, are more highly keepered or where there's more control, predator control going on, and whether we've got um, hotspots of, uh, or real hotspots, um, super hotspots of predators, whether it be I mean, obviously, we'd expect the forest edge uh, of Kersep and Spade Adam forests to, to <clears throat> be yielding a lot of foxes and, uh, and crows. But as we come away from that um, very forest edge, have we got other hotspots that we should, as a community, kind of look at, right, how can we work together to um, reduce the impact of predation in specific areas? I mean, I know Colin probably volunteered to get out the chainsaw and chop curse up down and um, put it back to <clears throat> something a bit more uh, appropriate for both black grouse and curly. But failing that, um, you know, I'm afraid, I just want to box matches. Yeah, box <laughs> matches. <laughs> Colin, the fire starter. OK, <laughs> so um, is there a way in which if we're looking at this sort of uh, um, wading bird survey, um, we can find out a bit more about where the, the real hotspots of um, predators and particularly crows are, or do we know that already? Um, can we map that? Can we correlate that map with, with you know, the relative success or failure of, um, of the wading birds in the area? Sorry, that was an open question. <laughs> So, so without doubt, tree cover is um, a harbour of both foxes and carrying crows, and um, they have the impact of, of harbouring them, but also they put wading birds off from nesting. Um, so they have that edge effect where any land within a certain distance of any tree cover will, that breeding waders will avoid that anyway, whether there's predators in there or not because they will just put them off. And so the effect of, of tree cover or forestry has an effect beyond its boundary. Um, as to other areas of hotspots of predator activity, the more information and evidence that you can gather across an area will give you the greater information. And then that, that sort of evidence will start to appear maybe um, if you couple your information about predator location and density with with how the population of birds are doing. So that's certainly something that we've been doing um, with the curly work to date is to try and work out um, the impact of predation and the impact of predator control on populations of curly. So the more evidence you've got, the better really, because you can start to build a picture. I think that was really where, where I was coming from, is that um, th there is a lot of concern in the Forgotten Lands um, around whether it's the forest investment zone or just forestry um, planting applications, that the uh, <coughs> the, the plight of, um, particularly up on waders, waders, for example, is not thoroughly um, investigated. And particularly the impact of forest edge, so that if uh, you know, if, if a plantation that's gone in some years ago will have already had an impact and, on the neighbouring land and then the neighbouring land, if that comes up for sale for planting, then that, that's already gone down before the next survey is done and so on. So we're always a step behind yeah. in terms of the planning process. And so <clears throat> I think it really highlights the importance of that, of that gathering as much data as we can. But it'd be really good to um, keep to to keep in touch, Tina, about as you do that those more detailed surveys about the relationship between predation um, and breeding success. That that we keep sharing notes. Sure. It's a 
how we go on. Yes, it's certainly something as an organisation that we've pushed for is is um, is to have a more strategic and evidence based approach to planning uh, woodland creation. Um, and the more evidence that you guys can gather, um, the better, really. Um, it's it's all really good information. Like I said before, um, one of the things we're hoping to produce as part of my project is a sensitivity map. Um, for uh for forest for woodland creation so areas where you know there are hot spots for breeding maidens and we certainly won't want to see any trees put in but having a more strategic wider uh planning approach to woodland creation is obviously going to be much more beneficial in the long run has anybody else got any more questions they'd like to ask Hi. I'm sorry, I've got one more quick one. Oh, sorry, Alex, you've got you in. You were there first. Yeah, we've got a field. It's on the field in the farm that isn't in stewardship for, well, isn't eligible in stewardship for upland waders. And that's the one that we see the curdlers rising off of. Is there any way of changing that? I think um, I can answer that one. Um, <laughs> <laughs> and the answer is yes. Uh, so, um, if you so if you if you are seeing uh, waders in a field and it currently is mapped as no waders, if we've got that evidence of the waders, then um, when you're applying for countryside stewardship, it's the it's the map that says yay or nay. But if we have clear evidence, then you, we can change that map and uh, and and put them back on the map. And that makes a difference because if you don't have waders on that field and it's an upland SDA field, um, then if, if there are no waders marked there, then the maximum you can get is £16 a hectare. But if there are waders on that field and they're breeding and uh, can be successful, then it's £88 a hectare. So it's, it's in, it, if the, if the way, waders are there, it's in our interest to remap that. And that's exactly um what what we need to know but now you've told me that um you can just give me the, the field and we'll we'll remark that on our yeah. um, habitat map yeah get it added yeah that's something i've done in a few places before yeah there's there's a lot of anomalies on that uh, magic map as to you know wader fields non-wader fields whatever uh, you know, this year's countryside stewardship they have also said that they're going to relax a lot of the up2 requirement i think um but the map doesn't look any different to me on magic yet so i don't know if they're just going to not use the map at all anymore and take people's word for it i'm not sure but, um, but it definitely I, I think, yeah I, I, th I think they will but but um it's just about getting a bit of evidence so so if alex has said a, yeah. a wander out there and yeah he's seen the waders and he knows which field they're in and, and that that's exactly what we're trying to grasp um yeah. and the more we can find that where the waders are, the more we can fill in these holes in the in the map where there doesn't appear to be much, but there actually is. And that in turn helps obviously with your sensitivity mapping for woodland as well. Yes, exactly. Yes. So, you know, if, if Alex, then you find that there's another forestry planting application right next to you, you know, if it's not mapped, you know, it's really hard to, to argue against it. But if they are there, then yeah, absolutely. Yep, thank you. Just on that on that thing, Chris, is it just as important um, winter habitat for waders as as summer and breeding thing? It's just a, I have a field with about thirty or forty uh, golden plover that spend all winter in there. Is that not just as important as what a field is where they're breeding? I know they go further up to breed a golden plover, but surely it's important that they have the. There must be a reason why they're in that field, and it's got to be important. Does that not fit into that criteria? So I'm going to throw that one back to Tina and 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 Janet for a moment because the the as far as I understand that on the magic maps the data is about breeding waders and what you're talking about is wintering habitat. Um, yeah, I think that's what the EP two does, but that doesn't mean yeah it should. You just feel like it's that sort of thing should be mapped somewhere because there's very few inland areas that really we've got one uh, on some Geltsdale reserve where large numbers of uh, or near Geltsdale where large numbers of lapwing overwinter um, and 
they're really important because most breeding waders head to the coast for the winter. So any inland sites where you know they are all winter are important. I'm just not sure off the top of my head how best we map those. Um, but it's something I can take away and ask the question about, uh, see if anyone's thought about it before. So yeah, they definitely should be recognised. Um, but I'm not sure that that breeding wader map is the right place for them. I'd be very grateful, Janet, if you would perhaps come back to us with um, something on that because yeah, I'll, I'll, when it I've, comes... made, I've made a note of it. I've made, just made a note of it, and I'll, uh, I'll I'll ask around and see if I can find out from. You know, there might be someone in, in the RSPB who knows that, or somewhere, someone somewhere else knows. That, so. uh, has anybody else got any, any more questions? Anybody anybody would like to ask? Sorry, I've got one more, and then I will shut up. It's just—it was just about. Um, I was sort of conscious of the fact that when we, if we're doing surveys, I totally agree with the idea of a methodology of surveys in in May, um, in order to be repeatable and um, uh, and, and robust, shall we say? Um, but I'm also always keen to try and think about um, everyone's days are short, time is busy. Obviously, April is flat out lambing and, and, and into May for some of you as well. Um, and it's just about trying to go with from, from an ideal point of view. Is there something that we can do that we're, where we need to compromise? So I quite like the idea of if, uh, if we actually want to get a bit of soil sampling done before um, fertilizer is spread, you know, actually combining, combining the bird walkover survey with other tasks. Um, so right now in March, might be if you're doing the survey in March, say if you did three surveys, you might say, well, actually, I'm going to spend half a day looking at drain outfalls and seeing if um, what drains are working. So that involves walking about, but you can combine that with with this with the other, other tasks relatively easily. Um, is there? I suppose it's just any any thoughts, perhaps from from the farmers, of how how you could actually sort of build that survey into other tasks it doesn't work quite so well if you're racing around on a quad bike um because you, you're going to disturb the birds and uh and it's quite hard to watch where you're going with the bike and watch the birds at the same time and you can't hear them either over the bike <laughs> can't hear them but i think i would recommend it actually walking around the farm is a great thing to do so yeah, and ideally, yeah. don't take your dog either, unless they're very well behaved. Because uh... <laughs> the dog will find them. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> that's quite interesting to see a farmer as it Wensdale, who was like highlight of his year, um, that just relaxing walk going round each year, recording the birds. <clears throat> I also think it'd be quite good to get the kids out after a year of homeschooling, is to send them round the farm, and and not let them uh, just stare at their iPhones for the day. Uh, maybe they, they can do some surveying, enlist wider help on the farm. Uh, yeah, that's one solution, train the youngsters up to do it. Yeah, yeah. It's only, there's only five species you need to recognise, it's not difficult. So. <laughs> Sounds like a school project for me. Catch them down, Chris, if Nicola will let you out. <laughs> Never wander around here. Never <laughs> <laughs> run peril okay. broad head. <laughs> Fair enough. Yeah, just to say that the, the, the method we've set out is, is one way of doing it. it. Like I say, it's consistent, it's repeatable. Um, but incidental records, they are useful, especially if, if you spot nests, you know, make a note by all means. As you're out, you're out on your farm every day, make a note of whatever you see in here. But doing the method we've set out sort of helps you see changes over time and compare yourselves with other areas and things like that but any incidental record is all useful information so even if you could just do that that would be useful yeah and you've, you've had a chat from the cbdc as well so you know where to send all your data records and data when you've got it all so it so it all gets recorded for the future <laughs> Yeah, regarding CBDC, uh, I sent a link round. Mustafa has um, improved the mobile app for recording and uh, also the online map's been updated. So it's got those land parcels what were originally missing there 
be, they've been added on. on. Um, I sent out those on, on, I think, Sunday. But if you haven't received those, I can, I can resend, send those if you, uh, if they're buried in emails. Um, but Julius has tried the online map and it appears to be um, working okay. And uh, I had a trial run. I sent something to the staff and he received it. So I think that's okay. And, and just to say also, um, RSVB is looking at ways in which to use mobile apps more increasingly. So I'm in a meeting tomorrow to talk to our uh, conservation data unit about some apps that we might be able to use with volunteers going forward that, that makes that job a little bit more easier rather than taking loads of maps out with you. So if I do learn of anything that's interesting or useful that you might be able to use, I can certainly pass that information on as well. That'd be good. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, has anybody else got anything? Just, just on that um, part of um, putting it down, I've just put on me on my phone on the notes part of it. Mm -hmm. I just put a, a date, what I've seen, how many I've seen. Good. That's that's. It's just the simplest way of doing it because carrying bits of paper and doing anything else is just not going to happen. Just trying to do it on the phone, and then it's going to be a rainy day job trying to put it. Sending it oh, to you. Hassle. Gold stars, Colin. Gold stars. Yeah, absolutely. absolutely. Yeah, no, that's a good. That's a good way of doing it. Yeah, I do. Yeah. Um, yeah. I mean, if that's everything, uh, I would just like to thank Janet and Tina um, for the presentation tonight. I mean, I, for, I, mean, I got, got a lot from that. Thank you very much for um, for that. And I made a recording of it so the people who didn't miss that. I'll send that uh, once I've got it edited and uploaded. Uh, I'll send that around to, to everybody. But yeah, thank you very much for this evening. You're very welcome. Yeah. Yeah. Very Thanks welcome. a lot. Thanks a lot. Thank no problem. Thank you very much.